But this morning we're just going to take a break for a moment and look at Psalm chapter 2. Psalm chapter 2. We consider these, um, this psalm, these 12 verses. <clears throat> psalm chapter 2. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry with you and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Therein lies our reading this morning. Let's just pray together, shall we? Father, Father, we just pray, Lord, as, as we look at your word, this divinely inspired text, Lord, I pray that you'd bless it to our hearts this morning. Grant us your grace to hear from you. Lord, be with us, Father, and honour your name, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the title that I have in my uh, Bible of this psalm, The Messiah's Triumph and Kingdom. The Messiah's Triumph and Kingdom. Uh, we have a psalm here written by the psalmist David. Now, it doesn't give a title to who wrote it in uh, Psalm 2, but in the book of Acts, it, uh, it quotes the psalm and gives us the author, uh, David, the king, this uh, mighty king of Israel, uh, who uh, led the people of God in the, this Davidic dynasty. And uh, here he writes uh, this psalm concerning the triumph of this Messiah, this coming Messiah, uh, and the, the kingdoms, the kings of the earth that were raging against God. And we see, um, firstly, this morning I want to talk about the, the opposition that we see to the Messiah's reign. The opposition that we see to the Messiah's reign. It says in verse 1, uh, we see the nations that rage, uh, and we see the people, the people that plot. And then in uh, verse 2, we, we see this um, picture of the kings of the earth and the rulers that come together. So we see this overarching reality of a collection of different individuals, the nations, the peoples, the kings, and the rulers that come against God, that, that gravitate and oppose the God of heaven. But what are some of the characteristics of those who oppose, the, oppose God and oppose his, his Messiah that's going to come into the world? Well, firstly, we see this raging of the nations, this raging of the nations. In the Old Testament, we see these uh, non-Jewish nations. Um, we see uh, Israel being the recipients of, uh, of, of God's covenant promises to Abraham. And how, now we see this uh, Davidic promise about how there's going to be one who comes from the seed of David. Uh, I know there's a connection there to Solomon, but we see a, a pointing forward to this Messiah that's going to come. In the future, but this nation of Israel that God had chosen, but with these covenant blessings, was surrounded by nations uh, that were ungodly. They they didn't have the promise of God upon them. They weren't part of God's covenant uh, people. We we read of uh, nations such as the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, uh, the the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And as uh, the people of God entered into the promised land, we see this constant conflict that was taking place that they were to be purged, the promised land was to be purged of these, these nations that were raging against God. This worldwide collective 
rebellion. We see in verse 1, why do the nations rage? That's a good question for us to consider, isn't it? Why do nations rage against God? Why are these people coming against God and, and gravitating and opposing this King who is to come, this Messiah who is to come? Well, really, it's this expression of man's natural condition. From the beginning of time, from the dawn of time, we see mankind with a, a fallen, sinful nature who, uh, thanks, who, who opposes uh, the God of heaven. Uh, we've seen that, really, from the first uh, sin that took place. We see this rebellion towards God, and then each man and woman that's been born into this world from that point on is in this condition of rebellion, this condition of rage against God. Don't think, when we think about the world around us today, I've mentioned this before, don't think that men and women are indifferent towards the things of God. Men and women in, in their natural condition have a, a proclivity, a leaning towards rebellion towards God, a, a leaning towards an anger and, a, and, a, and a, an opposition, a rage within their hearts towards God. What does this raging look like? Well, we see in verse 1, it says, The people plot, they plot a vain thing, plotting against God, plotting against Him, actively seeking to oppose His reign and His rule over their lives. As opposed to Psalm chapter, chapter 1, we know in Psalm 1, we, we hear of this blessed man, this blessed man who meditates on the law of the Lord day and night. That's the, that's the sign of a blessed man, someone who comes and yields to the law of God, who, who looks to God, meditating upon his law day and night. But mankind in their natural condition is plotting against him. They may be looking at his law, but trying to look at his law in a way so in order as to find loopholes to get round it, to twist it, or as the scriptures tell us, to distort the scriptures to their own destruction. There are men and women who do that, who are still dead in their sin, still raging against God, still plotting against him, that will actually use the word of God in order to justify sinful lifestyles. People do, people do do that. Mankind all over this world, is an, they're experts at inventing and conjuring up all kinds of evils, all kinds of things that we can do. I mean, when you really think about th some of the things that are going on in this world today, some things that are even so evil, it's, it's, it, it would be shameful to even speak them from a pulpit in this sense. Mankind is, is constantly plotting and thinking of new evils that they can accomplish. And don't think that doesn't go on in Western culture, because it does. We live in a world today that is entrenched in great evil. 800 unborn children every working week in the UK alone are slaughtered in the wombs of their mothers. We have a, we have a country that, le that has legalized that from the top down. Mankind is always plotting. And this plotting is a vain thing. It says in, verse, in uh, <coughs> verse 1, the people plot in vain. It's a vain thing. It comes to nothing in the end except destruction and ruin. The Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man which leads unto death. This plotting may seem right to them. Let's plot against the Creator. Let's plot against the one who gives us life. Let's plot against this one who's going to send his son into the world. But in the end it leads to emptiness, destitution and destruction. There are people all over the world today that are inwardly fighting against their Creator. Inwardly raging against Him. Inwardly plotting against the God of heaven. But it will do nothing in the end except to bring them to ruin. They may enjoy their sin for a season. The Bible says that sin is pleasurable for a season and then once that season is over, there is nothing more or less than destruction and that God will pour out His judgment upon those who plot against Him. And then we see in verse 2, We've seen plotting, the people plotting against God. And we see in verse 2, the kings of the earth who set themselves, set themselves. Now, we know that kings are appointed by God. Leaders are appointed by God. Romans 13, verse 1 tells us very clearly, let every soul be subject 
to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. God appoints authorities, even the Prime Minister in England today, the President of the United States, every king that exists over the face of planet Earth has been appointed by God. It says there is no authority other than that which exists, uh, uh, that, that, that exists other than that which is appointed by God. Proverbs 21 verse 1 tells us, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, and like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. You see, the Lord uses leaders <clears throat> for his own purposes. Now, we need to recognize that leaders, in a state sense, governors and kings, in a in a, non, in a non-Jewish sense, if I could put it like that, are not pastors. They're not leaders of churches. They don't have that spiritual authority. It's, a, it's interesting, like when Donald Trump recently, I don't, I don't want to get too political, political from the pulpit, but Donald Trump comes into power, and it's almost like many Christians believe somehow this is going to be like the saviour to the United States of America. You see, re- secular leaders in a, in a state sense aren't necessarily spiritually uh, they're not necessarily spiritual uh, leaders in that with that spiritual authority but they are God's deacons they are God's ministers there have been men and women well certainly men in times past that have led nations in a, in a, in a spiritually righteous way they've chosen righteous laws to adopt The righteousness has been reflected in the law of the land. We think of the the Puritan age, for example, and the Constitution of the United States of America. Many of these men uh, adopted godly principles on which to base this nation, on which to see a nation, nation flourish. And we often see nations flourish because righteousness has been chosen over and above sinful ways. But we see here in our text, verse 2, these kings that have set themselves, that have set themselves. Now that doesn't mean necessarily that they've appointed themselves, but there's a a picture here of setting themselves over. They've set themselves over and above God, so to speak. The kings of the earth have set themselves. There's a a pridefulness about that text. There's there's a, a pridefulness about the the leaders there that, that Psalm 2 is referring to. They're not men that, uh, that are seeking to install righteousness within the nations that, they're, that they've been given charge over, but they're setting themselves over and above the things of God. And we see that is only a recipe for failure and for disaster in the Scriptures. Do you remember Nebuchadnezzar and the pride that was found in his heart in Daniel chapter 4? He said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honour of my majesty? Here's a king that was setting himself forward, setting himself over and above God, so to speak. And we we know what happened in Daniel 4. Whilst he was still speaking, there was a voice from heaven saying to King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you. And we know that he, went, he was driven out of his mind and he was eating grass like the oxen of the field. His fingernails grew like the claws, uh, like birds' claws. We, we, kings have been appointed by God. We see that in Romans 13. But they're still kings of the earth. In our text today it says, the kings of the earth set themselves. Yes, they've been appointed to the positions of leadership, but they must never forget and they must recognize that they are still subservient to the king of heaven. They must recognize their, their rightful place. For example, King Charles has recently been um, uh, crowned king of England. He's been crowned the king by the God of heaven, but he needs to realize that there is a rightful place for him under the God of heaven. Earthly kings are no match whatsoever for the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords. We see in verse 2 the rulers. So we've spoken about the kings of verse 2 and then it goes on in verse 2, the second half. The rulers take counsel together. They take counsel together. Remember back in Psalm chapter 1 verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. (coughs) 
You see, the blessed man is one that doesn't walk in ungodly counsel. One who walks separately from ungodly counsel. Do you know the Christian life can sometimes be a lonely life? It can be a life of a, it's a narrow way. It's a life where you have to chew, you have to go against the grain, you have to go, you have to walk against the current, so to speak. It's easy to walk in the counsel of ungodliness if you, if you have a sin nature that hasn't been changed. But we see here today in our text, verse 2, that, this, that these rulers take counsel together. And it's an unwise counsel. Verse 10, it says, Now therefore be wise, O kings. To be wise is to trust this Messiah, to trust this king. And therefore, by very default, to take counsel against him is to be unwise, it's to be foolish. It's foolish to gravitate and to rage against God and to have that counsel together. We see a plurality here within this council. This ungodly general consensus. You know, the mass majority of people on the face of planet Earth today are gravitating and opposing God. That's the reality of it. Jesus said the gate is wide, the road is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many that are on that path. He said that there's many for a reason. There are many, many people that are gathered together in that, in that sense and, and, and opposing the God of heaven. And the enemies of God often, often like to join together, to take counsel together. It's a, a sense in which it's a, a strategy of, of strength in numbers. We know that God has organized nations, he's organized uh, leaders, so to speak, and governs political powers. Uh, he's given authorities to rule for the, for the good, as we see in Romans 13. However, the enemy often uses the same structures in order to tear down nations, in order to oppose godliness. He gathers men together. Do you remember the Tower of Babel? They came together. And they opposed God as one people against him, coming against him in opposition. We see this on a, on a, world, a world scale here in our text. Why do the nations rage? This is a plurality, a plurality of nations raging against God. Now, boundaries are helpful. We must guard against Christian, you know, we must guard against the idea of Christian nationalism that believes that there's some kind of, th uh, some kind of nation that's going to be used by God at the current present time. We know that God now speaks through his church. We don't have this theocratic Old Testament nation of Israel. We must guard against Christian nationalism. We see now this explosion of the gospel in the new covenant age going to every tribe and tongue across the world. But you know, boundaries are helpful. National boundaries are helpful and they've been instituted by God. Boundaries for nations are helpful. We see the powers that be that are trying to attempt a globalization, again, not wanting to get too political. We see organizations that are bringing countries together now, in some ways, that can be helpful, but it's also very dangerous. The enemy can often use uh, the principles behind globalization, behind nations coming together as one. It's a very dangerous uh, path to tread. And we as Christians, but that not, not only on a world scale where we see the world powers at work, coming together to rage against God, but we can see this even within the church. We see different movements within the church that come together. They link arm in arm, opposing the word of God. Different denominations that will link with other denominations and institute sinful ideas oppose it, that oppose the word of God. And we must be prepared as Christians to take a stand for the truth. There may be times when 
It doesn't matter if, 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 if all the denominations of the United Kingdom came together and suddenly said something like, for example, same-sex marriage is now uh, legitimate and it's something we should practice. We as Christians must stand for the truth. If we're the only people that are actually standing for what is true and real, we must still stand for the truth. Just because the general consensus makes a particular point, if it's not biblical, then we don't take that point. We don't stand with them. You know, I've often used this expression and probably use it again, but Noah was right and the whole world was wrong. God is not determined on the ma- how many people believe something. The truth of God is not defined by how many people believe something. The truth of God is defined by what he has said in his word. Are there areas that Christians, uh, you know, agree to disagree on and we work together in love with one another? Of course There always will be. None of us believe exactly the same thing all the time. But there are certain things that are very clear in Scripture that we cannot compromise on as God's people. What was the result of this counsel that's been taken? This raging that goes on, this plotting, uh, uh, these kings that set themselves over and above God. What is the result? Well, we can see in verse 2 that This counsel that's been taken is against the Lord and against his anointed. The attack, really, as David is sharing this psalm, maybe there's a sense in which there's an attack upon him and his kingdom, but the picture here is that this greater attack from these kings and these that rage against, these nations that rage, is ultimately against God himself. David here in this psalm, who's seated upon the throne in an earthly sense, pointing us not just to the realities of the enemies that are refusing to come and yield to him as king, but to the one who reigns over all creation. This idea of the anointed one means the Messiah, the Christ, to deny God's anointed one is to deny God himself. To deny God himself. And that's really in essence what these nations are gravitating against. They're gravitating against God and in, a, and in one sense they're gravitating against him but in another they're gravitating uh, first and foremost against his anointed one. Against the Christ. Do you know anyone who denies Jesus as the Christ, anyone who denies the Son, denies the Father. 1 John chapter 2, verses 22 and 23. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. I, once, um, I remember hearing a preacher once talking about the, the uh, Muslims and he said, uh, oh, they know the Father but they just don't know the Son. And at the time I thought, that doesn't, that doesn't sound right to me. I mean, I was actually, I wasn't a Christian back then anyway. And even, even back then it didn't seem right. But looking at it now, it's, the, Jesus is very clear. If you don't know the Son, you don't know the Father. If you haven't come to the Son, then you haven't got the Father. It doesn't matter what religious background you are from, whether you're Jew or Gentile, if you haven't acknowledged the Son as Christ, the Messiah, and come and trusted in Him, then you don't know the Father in a saving way. So they gravitate against this anointed one, this Christ, this Messiah who's going to come into the world and deal with the sins of His people and, and rise again to be seated at the right hand of the Father. That's the, that's the manifestation of, of the rebellion of mankind. It's interesting, isn't it? You can, there's lots of people that will talk about God. They'll talk all day about God. As soon as you bring the word Jesus to the conversation, all of a sudden you see the reaction, you see the manifestation of anger, because Jesus is the true God of heaven. There are many people who have ideas about God in their minds, but it's actually just idolatry. It's a God that they've made. But when you get specific about who this God is, about how you are made right with this God, about this anointed one, that's when you start to see the real heart of an individual begin to manifest. So they rage against the anointed one. And we see in verse 3, let us break break their bonds in pieces. 
and cast away their cords from us. Let us break their bonds. Speaking of God here, the bonds of God and the cords of God in a sense. How, how do they do this? By breaking their bonds and casting away their cords. This re- really, this idea of breaking their bonds is a, it's a metaphor for rebellion. Let us break away from God. Let us rebel against him. Mankind is bound, when we're bought, we're conceived with sin natures, and we grow in our bondage towards sin. We grow in our spiritually enslaved condition throughout our lives. Mankind is bound by many, many different things. Many, many idols bind the hearts of mankind. But what we see here is a picture of people breaking the bonds of God upon them, casting off the restraints, throwing off the restraints, so to speak. Proverbs 29, 18 speaks of where there is no revelation. In some translations it says where there's no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. So when there's no revelation of God amongst the people, they they throw off the restraint, they run free, they run in a lawless way. But you know, being bound to God Being bound to God is a wonderful place to be. It's the best place to be. Remember what what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11. 11. He said, Come unto me, all you who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You see, everybody's bound to something. You're either bound to sin, you're either bound to selfishness, prideful, sinful ways, or you're a bondservant of Jesus. You're bound to Christ. You're a slave of Christ, a doulos. You're a a slave of Christ. And there's there's no more... It's interesting, isn't it? It's ironic because people think that casting off the restraints of God upon them is going to make them truly free. But actually, casting off the restraints of God drives you deeper and deeper into spiritual enslavement, spiritual bondage. It's only when you come to God and you take on the yoke of Christ that you take his his yoke which is easy and his burden which is light. It's only when you come and you, you, you yield to the will of God that you can truly know freedom in its in its most perfect and purest sense. The unbeliever will, be, will say, oh, being, bound, being a Christian, it's too restrictive. You hear, I've heard, I remember hearing an actor on TV say that once. He said, oh, I grew up religious. I grew up as a Baptist, but it was, I found it too restrictive. So I turned my back on my faith, and now I'm free. But actually, failing to realise, he's become more and more deceived, more and more enslaved, more and more darkened. You see this sometimes with children from Christian families. They would grow to the age where they can fly the nest, And the restraints are cast off. And you see them plunge headfirst into sin, a lifestyle of debauchery and and evil. Because they believe it it to be liberating, whereas it's actually a deception. The, the The truly liberating position is to be restrained by God, to be joined to God in union with God through Christ the Lord. Charles Spurgeon said these words, To a graceless neck, the yoke of Christ is intolerable, but but to the saved sinner, it is easy and light. We may judge ourselves by this. Do we love that yoke, or do we wish to cast it off from us? Do we love the yoke? Do you love the yoke of Christ that's been placed on your neck as a believer, or do you wish to cast it off? So we've looked at the opposition to the Messiah's reign. Let's think about the certainty of the Messiah's reign. The certainty. But why do the nations rage? Good question, right? Why do they do that? David asked this question in a rhetorical sense. It is a vain thing. It comes to nothing. We've spoken about that already. But what's God's response to this vanity? What's God's response to this vain attempt of the peoples to rage against him, to oppose his authority and to cast him out of their thoughts? Well, what's his response? We see in verse 4, He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. 
He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. A response of laughter. Now this isn't some sadistic, insidious kind of laughter. He's not taking pleasure in sin or rebellion. But we see here a picture of, of his holy strength. His holy and righteous power and love against all that is contrary to his nature. The kings of the earth are no match for the king of heaven. And since the Lord is not dismayed, we shouldn't be dismayed either. If that's God's response to men and women, to, to, to nations that, that rage against him, if that's God's response to laugh from the heavens, then we as his people, we shouldn't become um, troubled. We shouldn't become uh, downcast when we see the nations that rage against God. If anything, it proves to us that God's word is true. When we see men and women actively in rebellion towards God, it shows us that the word is true, that God is on the throne. And if he is in this position of, 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 of laughing, so to speak, then how, 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 much, uh, how less should we... Um, how much more should we also take comfort in the fact that we have a God who calls us to not be dismayed over these things? It says in verse 4 that he, he shows derision. This idea of derision is to, to mock or to scoff, to scorn, so to speak. It's like, um, it's like a, a, a little kitten that comes up to a lion and this little kitten is clawing at the lion and the lion's just... It's not even, it's not even uh, affecting him. He just palms this kitten off and keeps walking, showing this derision, uh, uh, this, this uh, symbol, this expression of power uh, and the fact that he overrules and he's sovereignly in control of all these things. I, I've heard this expression uh, from another pastor about if all the uh, armies of hell and the, and, and the enemies of God came together to, uh, to attack God, they would have no more power than a, than a little fly beating its head against a, a rock of granite. God is on the throne. He laughs from the heavens at these who try to oppose him. And it is because he's on the throne. You see here in verse 4, he who sits in the heavens. This is a picture of where God is. He's in the heavens. He's reigning over all creation. He's not like the kings of this earth. He's, he's not on an earthly throne. He's not, he has no equal as I was speaking about last week. He's not like the king of a kingdom that comes and goes. But his throne is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness. And he's the one whose son is seated on the throne. The king, the father, is speaking here in verse 6. He says, I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. This is the father speaking. I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. My king. God wants them to know this. Especially the kings of the earth. He wants the kings of the earth to know that he has set his king. The Lord he counters the plotting of the kings of the earth by pointing to them and expressing the establishment of his own messianic kingdom on the holy hill of Zion. Now Zion being north of the Davidic city of Jerusalem, it's important because it was the location of the temple at that point in time, the place where of God's special covenant presence with his people. Hence the word, my holy hill. Um, sometimes Jerusalem is also known um, uh, on a whole, uh, it's known as Zion. Um, but it was the epicenter of the Davidic dynasty. It's where David ruled from Zion. But this Davidic dynasty was a, a precursor to the greater king, the, the Christ, the Messiah, who, entered, uh, who hasn't entered an earthly temple, but taken his, now taken his seat, his rightful seat, upon the throne of heaven itself. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 to 20. And what is the exceeding greatness of the power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. So Jesus rose from the dead and he hasn't taken a seat in an earthly sense but he's risen and he's in the heavenly places taking his seat in heaven. Hebrews chapter 9, 24 For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands 
which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. And this here is a picture, this idea of his king sitting, uh, uh, being set on, on my holy hill of Zion. We have a picture here of Christ taking his rightful place as the king of all creation in the heavenlies. And then we see G the, the Son himself offering a declaration, a triumph which has been declared and affirmed by the Son, verses 7, 7 to 9. The Son says, I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, you are my Son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash, dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Verse 7. Now what does it mean when we, when we hear the word begotten? Um, there are many different groups and cults out there that like to think that this proves that Jesus is a created being. But the word begotten doesn't mean created, it's, it's the, the idea of bringing forth, to bear or to be delivered like a child being born, a bringing forth of a child. And when something is created, that it, it didn't previously exist. But this idea of being begotten uh, is, is in a sense a, a, a child that continues on, that has been brought forth from the lineage of their parents, so to speak. In connection to begottenness in the scriptures, uh, sometimes the scriptures uh, refer to Christ as being the firstborn. The firstborn. Um, in Psalm 89, verse 27, we see a title for the Messiah, for Christ himself. It says, also I will make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. So Christ is this firstborn who's the highest of the kings of the earth. That's Psalm 89, verse 27. In Romans chapter 8, verse 29, it says, it calls him the firstborn among many brothers, among many, many brethren. Um, so you see this plurality of those who are being born of God, and we know as Christians that we are born of God. In Colossians 1, 15, it talks about him being the firstborn of all creation. Colossians 1, 18, the firstborn from the dead, that in him he might be preeminent. Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, and Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth. That's very much connected to our passage here today in Psalm 2. Hebrews 12, 23 speaks about Christ, uh, to the, oh, sorry, to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. So you see, in a sense, we are involved with this, um, with this body of Christ. As Christians, he is our elder brother. He's the firstborn from the dead and we must be born again in order to be held in heaven with him. And as we read last week in Hebrews chapter 1, when he, that's the Father, brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. So as Christ rose from the dead, this firstborn, having been risen from the dead, entering into heaven, uh, opening the gates of heaven, taking his rightful seat upon the throne, and leading his people uh, to uh, that position of glory with him for all eternity. <clears throat> so it's a triumph that's declared and affirmed by the Son. It's, it's the Son who's receiving an inheritance. Again, he's, he's called the firstborn, um, not the first created. Now the word, the word firstborn, when we think about this begottenness of Christ, comes from a Greek word prototokos, which is connected to a person's position uh, the position of a, of, uh, and priority within a family. It's not necessarily the firstborn as in the eldest child in a family. It's to do with the, an individual within the family that has the birthright. Um, the firstborn position in, in ancient Near, e Near Eastern culture um, was to do with those who possessed the inheritance and would hold future leadership within the family. So they wouldn't necessarily, so I would call Bethany my firstborn, but actually in Western modern contemporary culture, we call our firstborn our eldest child, whereas in ancient Near Eastern culture, the firstborn would be the one who the inheritance goes to. It's the one who takes the future leadership of the family. 
And we see that here in the context of this Messiah's resurrected position. Christ has now risen from the dead. Verse 8. This is being spoken to... um, Verse 8 here, speaking to the Father. The Father says, Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. You see, Christ is coming to the throne and asking the Father to receive the nations as an inheritance. And what is the inheritance that Christ receives? Well, so what's the inheritance of Christ? What is it? Well, it's his people, it's us. We, are, we as Christians are the inheritance that Christ, that Christ receives. We're, we're a love gift from the Father to the Son. Christians are that love gift that God the Father gives to his Son. John chapter 17 We know in Jesus' high priestly prayer, verse 6, he says, I have manifested your name to to, to the men whom you have given me out of the world. See, God God the Father has given men to the Son. They were yours and you gave them to me and and they have kept your word. John 17, verse 9, I pray for them. I I do not pray for the world, but for those who you have given me. For they are yours, and all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And this is the reason for this inheritance, that Christ would be glorified in his bride, that Christ would be glorified in his people. So Christ has risen from the dead, and and, and we see here the Father say, Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. So we see initially the nations that are raging against God, But now we see as Christ has risen from the dead, he's receiving the nations of all this world as an inheritance to himself. This this is no longer confined to a Jewish theocracy, a Jewish uh, state uh, necessarily, so to speak, but Christ has risen and the gospel has gone out across the Gentile world and the nations that were once raging against him are being won uh, to him, as we looked at in 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, the other week that he's seated on the throne and he's reigning over his enemies and his enemies are being put under his feet uh, uh, until that final enemy of death is destroyed. We see here Jesus having the nations given to him as an inheritance and that's us. Saints, if you're a Christian in here, if you've been born of the Spirit of God, you are a gift from the Father to the Son. You've been given by God to the Son. And we just looked, what is the reason for that? That I may be glorified in them. And that's the purpose of this whole thing. That's the purpose of salvation. The purpose of salvation is not first and foremost so that you avoid going to hell and go to heaven. But the purpose of salvation is that Christ the Son is glorified in his people for all eternity to come. That's what heaven will be. It will be a multitude of saints crying out for all eternity, worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Worthy is the Lamb. That Jesus Christ, the righteous one, this Messiah, just several, many hundreds of years later after this psalm was written, would come into the world. The Messiah would come, live the perfect life that we cannot live, die that death that we deserve, taking the penalty and the judgment that should fall on us for our sins, fell upon him on the cross, and he had, no de- he had no sin of his own, and death couldn't hold him, and he raised from the, from the dead, he was risen, and he's entered into heaven and taken his rightful seat upon the throne of heaven as the God of heaven. The Bible says, doesn't it, in, we, we looked at this last week, Hebrews chapter 1, your throne, O God, is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness. This is an eternal throne that he is seated on, and he's reigning over all his creation. And the Father says, ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. That's what Christ is doing now. That's what God is doing. The Father is giving his people to the Son and there are being multitudes, one out of darkness from this Gentile world, Gentile and Jew alike. The middle wall of separation has been broken down and God is building his church and against his church the gates of hell will not prevail. <clears throat> he's one who's receiving an inheritance. He's one who's speaking to them. 
He's speaking to them in his wrath. You see, this one who's receiving the, the inheritance is also the one who's been given the right to judge. He's been given all authority to judge the living and the dead from the first two human beings, Adam and Eve, to the very last human that's ever going to be conceived. Jesus Christ is the one who sits on his throne, the one who has the right to judge. He judges men and women. And we know that his wrath is going to be poured out on the unbeliever for all eternity. Verse 5, it says, Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. God's judgment is something that is very serious. It's something that should be taken seriously. We often think about the wrath of God and you know, we kind of brush over these verses. This is something that's going to fall upon many, many people. Revelation chapter 6, verses 15 to 17 says, And the kings of the earth, the kings of the earth, again, the context here is the kings that are raging against God, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, they hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us! And hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? What a picture that man would, would prefer to have mountains bury them than to be subject to the wrath of the Lamb. This great day that is to come. Now however you want to view that eschatologically, you, one thing is for certain. It is a fearful and terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. These opposing kings, these opposing leaders, these opposing nations in Psalm chapter 2, they're no match for this true king of kings who sits in judgment and exercises all authority over his creatures, over the kings that he has put in place. They will give an account. Do you know that leaders that choose unrighteous decrees, leaders that gravitate against God, will stand and give an account before God. These laws that are passed that allow such evils in our own day today that go, go on behind the scenes and are, and are often overlooked. God will demand justice. God will pour out wrath in a just and righteous way. He's the king of all kings. Have you ever thought about that? You know, it's, it, might look, it might look good on a banner inside a church building, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We, we let these things just come off of, our, off of our tongues, don't we? And throughout one ear and out the other ear. But have you ever thought about what it means that he's the King of all kings? That he's the Lord of all lords? That they will all stand and give an account before him for the deeds that have been done in the body. Jesus is a righteous King and he's one who will pour out his wrath upon his enemies. We love the Christmas card, Jesus, don't we? With the, the baby in the manger and the, the sheep over the shoulders. But if we consider the Jesus of 2 Thessalonians, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel, of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Judgment has been given to Christ. This same one who made human beings is the one who died for human beings and he's the same one who will judge human beings. Let's just finish as we, as we consider our final point now. The mercy of the Messiah's reign. We've spoken about the triumph of the Messiah, this exalted position, this inheritance that he's received, these nations that are raging against him. We've spoken about his just and righteous position on the throne. But let's think of his mercy. Even in the midst of such rebellion, we see the rebellion of these, these individuals, these, the, the council of the multitude, the peoples that plot in vain, the nations that rage against him. But even in the midst of this rebellion, we see great mercy. Do you remember Alistair's message for those who were there a few weeks back? The, the burden of the prophet Habakkuk says, Lord, in, in wrath, remember mercy. 
And we have a God that is wrathful. He's a God who will punish. He's righteous. And his anger is not like our anger. Often our, our anger is often just sin. That's all our, often our anger is just sin spewing out of, our, in, out of our hearts and out of our minds. But God's wrath and judgment is perfectly pure. It's loving. It's the, it's the manifestation of, of his holy and righteous indignation against all that is contrary to his nature. Everything that opposes the nature of God must be judged by him. In the same way, if you flew to the sun, you're going to get burned because the sun is hot. When sin enters the presence of God, it will be judged because God is just and righteous and holy. But he's also merciful. And his mercy is not taken away from his... It's not fragmented. It's not like two sides of a coin. It's encapsulated with all his attributes this God of heaven who shows his wrath and his mercy at the cross as he's poured out his judgment on his son so as, to expect, so as to extend his grace and his mercy towards those who would believe. Notice in verse 5 it says, God speaks to them in his wrath. There's a picture. You could look at that and you could say his wrath is, is speaking to those, to, the, to those who are in rebellion. But also we could look at it and see he's actually communicating, he's, he's revealing himself to them. He's warning them, so to speak, loud and clear. Loud and clear. We see these warnings all over the world today. God speaks to people in his wrath, doesn't he? We live in a world that's under the curse. And because of the curse, subsequently we see suffering. We see cataclysmic travesties. We see floods and tsunamis and earthquakes and, and volcanoes. We see death. We see suffering all around us, this universal suffering that the curse of, the, of this world is placed this world under. But even within, these, even within that curse, God is speaking to this world. You see, every time we see these tsunamis, every time we see this brokenness, it cries out to us that, that there is a God in heaven who calls us to come to him calls us to, to get right with him. It cries out to us that something is broken. If you're in a car, you can hear, you're driving along, you can hear something clicking. You can hear the engine clicking in the car. That is a noise that's warning you. If you're on a motorway driving at 70 miles an hour and you can hear the tyre clicking, that's warning you you need to get off the motorway. You need to get into the services. You need to get this fixed. It's dangerous. And we're in a world, we live in a world today where there's a clicking noise of, of, of suffering. I don't want to uh, trivialize the realities of pain for many, many people, including even maybe some in here. But when we see suffering and when we, it, when we look around and we see pain and we see sin, it should show us that we need a saviour, that we need to come to God, that we need to make terms of peace with him. He speaks to us in his wrath. He speaks to us in his word. God has revealed himself to mankind primarily and chiefly in his word. 66 books of the canon of scripture from Genesis through to Revelation. God has revealed his will to us. The Bible says that the, 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 the scriptures have been written by holy men of God as they were carried by the spirit of God. That all scripture, 2 Timothy 3.16, is theonoustos. It's breathed out by God. It's profitable uh, for us as his people. The gospel, we heard the gospel, we heard someone speak to us. We heard about the wrath of God that's coming. We heard about his salvation that is found in his son. God, in his mercy, he spoke to us. If we're in here today and we're Christians, at some point we heard about Jesus. Someone was brave enough and bold enough and faithful enough to step out, whether it be in a church, whether it be on a street corner, whether it be in a living room, whether it be a, over, the, over a coffee table, someone was brave enough to speak to us about the goodness of God and what he's done for us in his son Jesus Christ. And you know something, Church of Jesus Christ, we have an ob not only do we have an obligation, but we have a duty to be telling other people about the way of salvation through Jesus Christ. David here is declaring this hope to the kings of his day that are in rebellion against God. And we as the church should be declaring this hope to men and women, including kings in our day, including the leaders of the nation. They need to be told. People need to tell King Charles. People need to tell um, the, the, the latest prime minister, the latest president, that you're going to stand and be accountable before God for the decisions that you make. 
God has called you as a minister, as a deacon to the people. And if, we, and if you continue to walk in unrighteousness, there will be judgment that will come. As the people of God, we are a chosen generation. 1 Peter 2, 9 says, You're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. And there's a reason for that. Not just so that we can be whisked off to heaven, but that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. That is the, that is the, 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 um, that's the fragrance of the Christian life, is one who's proclaiming the praises of of God to those around us. So he speaks to us and he invites us. We can be blessed in him. It's a blessed thing to come to God. It's a decree that we see in here in verses 10 to 12 as we close now. Verse 12, it says at the very end of our passage, blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Blessed are all those who trust in him. We, we hear of this blessed man, don't we, in the Psalms. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Blessed is the man. This idea of being blessed is a, really the root word is happy. It's a true happiness. It's a true contentness, contentness that we're blessed to be putting our trust in him. And that is how we make terms of peace with this king. It's by trusting in him. You know in, you know in Psalm chapter 1, when it says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, who stands not in the path of the sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. That's the blessed man. That's the picture of the blessed man, someone who takes delight in God's law and turns away from sin. Well, you see, true blessedness isn't about just avoiding sin. And reading your Bible, true blessedness is about trusting in Him. Back in our verse 12 today, blessed are all those who put their trust in Him. See, you can turn away from sin. There's lots of people in the world out there that stop doing the drugs, stop, stop you know, the immorality, stop doing this, turning over a new leaf. They hit the gym, they start, start trying to clean their lives up, get a good career, start trying to live a moral life in society. But that doesn't truly mean that's not the true meaning of being blessed by God the true meaning is trusting in him believing on the Lord Jesus Christ coming and kissing the son I'll finish on this now therefore be wise O kings verse 10 be instructed you judges of the earth serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way that's the message to the leaders of this world, to kiss the sun, to get right with God. That These leaders need to come and make terms of peace with Christ through faith, through trusting in him. This idea of kissing the sun, lest he be angry with you, it's an, expression of, it's an expression of servitude. They come and they serve this king, and they kiss, they kiss this king in servitude, but it's also an expression of genuine affection. It's not like, oh, I need to just serve Jesus in order to get something from him, but a genuine affection for what he's done. And that's the Christian life, is it not? We don't just come to, to Jesus to get something from him, to get heaven, but we come to Jesus because he's worthy. We come to Jesus out of gratitude for who he is, for what he's done for us on that cross. Praise the Lord, brethren, that we have a, a king who's in heaven, We have this Messiah who's on the throne, this anointed one who's drawing his people as an inheritance, he's he's receiving his people as an inheritance through the history of the ages. And what a privilege it is to to be part of that inheritance, that we are with him now in, in that present tense reality and we will be with him. You know, Jesus said, where I go, you will be also. He's on the throne, he's in heaven. And we will be there with him also. Praise the Lord that we who were once maybe raging in our own minds, we who maybe once were plotting vain things, I remember some of the stuff that I used to get up to, just trying to twist the scriptures to justify my sin, plotting against God. And God in his mercy spoke to me. He speaks to us, doesn't he, in the gospel. And we believe on the Lord 
and we're washed clean and welcomed into this eternal inheritance with him. Let's pray together, shall we?